understanding and for um, for this debugging, um, figuring out how to use a debugger. Okay, um, and and even filing, it's it's tangentially related. Um, so um, I'm going to close this up, the performance, and I'm going to open up something which is going to talk about um, this stuff is a little bit dry, but uh, turns out it's it's really important knowledge for understanding some some things. And hopefully it will make some puzzlements come together, um, you know, eliminate some puzzles for yourself. Um, and I think uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to stay away from, um, from going to dwelling too long on principles and try to connect it with sort of nitty gritty of, of what's going on. Um, but on the principle side, there's enough to be said. So it's going to help your models a lot if you use what we call encapsulation and abstraction. Um, this is basically um, hiding details, so you don't have to see details unless you need to. Agent-based models, um, one, of, one of the big vulnerabilities of agent-based models compared to models um, created, say, in, in stock and flows, is that agent-based models are going to have lots of pieces to them, and there's going to be lots of details, and those details can overwhelm you unless you, you actively work to, um, to hide them. You don't want your work with the model to be a, um, a process of enormous complexity. You may be modeling a complex system, but you don't want the modeling process to be a complex system. Um, and w one of the ways you can protect yourself from unnecessary complexity is by um, hiding details so that you only have to face them when you need to. Okay, um, so complexity of software development and model uh, and models by extension is a really major barrier um, within the modeling process, and this complexity can lead to models and broader, broader systems that are late, and it really can have extensive impact, um, sort of in, in technical spheres of what you can achieve, um, and you really want to strive for modularity in a model to reduce complexity, and uh, I have some. Uh, comments on the motivation for it, but a lot of the motivation is what's called separation of concerns. You want to you wanna, um, have within your model things that relate to different sub-pieces separated out. So when you could focus on one sub-piece at a time. Um, it turns out that that really, this whole divide and conquer strategy, dividing up the work among several pieces, also allows you to more easily uh, divide the work up between multiple people. It allows you to test things separately, so you can test pieces of a model. And as time allows in this course, I may be talking about how you can leverage other tools, also related to Eclipse, which I haven't listed here, like JUnit, um, Java unit testing, to test parts of your model. So you can, whenever you make a modification model, you can verify that it's still basically working in terms of the essentials, that you haven't introduced any, you know, anything to disasters. Um, and it can help in reviewing sort of pieces of your model uh, as well as to sort of just simplify your thinking as you're piecing together these things. So it's all about dividing conquer. It's about dividing things up so that you don't have to deal with unnecessary complexity. Um, and it turns out that computer scientists have long recognized that the way to do this is as abstraction. We call abstraction the process of forgetting certain details or hiding or abstracting away from certain details to treat many particular circumstances as, as fundamentally the same. And, and one of the keys to abstraction is to create methods, to create functions, okay? And the functions hide the details, okay? Um, and uh, this really helps to lessen the amount of work involved uh, when we need to modify our system. If we're, if we're working against functions, the function internals can change, and yet the code that uses it can remain unchanged. Um, so this is, it's very valuable in terms of um, insulating ourselves from change to capture code up in pieces, and each of those pieces then can evolve more or less independently, okay? Um, uh, I have some more comments that I can make here, but I want to get to the nitty gritty here. Um, so there's two major types of abstraction, and we've been working with one of the major types a lot, and that is class-based abstraction. 
our model is divided up into classes. So we have person, we have main in the most obvious case, but we might have other types of agents. Um, and in fact, we might have multiple main classes that we can use at different times um, uh, under different circumstances, as we saw for the ophthalmology example. Um, so one of the best ways to catch, to hide details, to hide unnecessary complexity is to create a class. The class takes responsibility for those sort of tasks. And, and all you have to know is what method to call the class. You have to know what it does, not how it does it. And the class hides the details, um, say, re related to personhood as far as main is concerned. Um, all you know is, okay, it accepts this message. So if you can send a person a message of this type, and it will get infected. How that infection takes place, all the details of the state charts involved, whether it's multiple state charts, that's all hidden in person. When you need to change that, you can go to person and put aside the issue of how, how um, you know, main is. So you can have these two different um, sort of uh, solitudes as it were. So this is one way you can hide details as in classes. The second way is in methods, okay, or functions. Um, and we're gonna concentrate on that today. Um, so basically, this, this allows us that we'll hide details about how a method accomplishes details. And it'll allow us to use its name, parameter values, and some brief description to know what it does, okay? Um, so a method, for example, might compute a value. All we know is it computes a value. It computes the number of neighbors of this agent. We don't know how it does it. We leave to any logic we, the, the responsibility of figuring out how it does it. And we leave to them the opportunity to change that over time between versions of any logic. Maybe they figure out some super fast way of counting the number of neighbors. It sounds absurd, but actually there's ways of, of, of doing things like that with appropriate data structures. Um, we leave to any logic details on how it gets the ith connected agent to ourselves. That's up to any logic. All we know is we have to call this method. If we give it these parameters, i has to be non-negative between zero and the number of connections minus one, et cetera, it will take care of the responsibility. So those are examples of things where it computes a value. It computes the number of connected agents, can returns to us a reference to our ith connected agent. Another method might test the condition, for example. It might ask, is this person infected? So we can ask p, where p is a reference to a person, dot is, uh, is infected. Now that judgment of whether or not they're infected might depend on multiple state charts. It might depend on one state chart. It might depend on variables they keep around. Um, who knows how person is defined it? All we know is that if we want to find that information, say in computing a statistic, we could just call p dot is infected. And we'll delegate to person, the implementation of person, implementation of is, is infected, how that's done. So in short, um, testing some condition, it might be a complex condition, it might be a simple condition, by wrapping it up in a method, we can avoid hard coding dependence on that condition. And that will allow a person to evolve, for example, to use two state charts instead of one, um, to, to have a uh, especially quick way of remembering whether or not they're in one of several infected states. It can evolve. Uh, without our code that depend that in our statistics from changing because all it calls is p dot is infected is infected could evolve as long as it still returns information on infection status um, another method might perform some update on a person for example it might infect a person so you could say p dot you know infect um, or it could uh, you know simulate the change of state resulting from some complex medical procedure or transmit infection to another. Alternatively, it might return a representation, like a string that returns information about a person, their name and serial number or what have you. Um, okay, so why use functional abstraction? Well, easier modifiability. There's only one place to update. If you change how it's done, you just change it in one place. We might have several statistics which ask, um, you know, is, is infected on a person. Um, 
One might ask if, if they're currently infected. Um, one might be seeking to return the number of people that are currently or previously infected or what have you. And we might call this from many places within our, within our uh, model. If we directly coded the, the condition for this at each of those places, we'd have to update each one in turn. And that leaves a lot of room for error. Here we have one place to change it in the method. Um, transparency, uh, giving it a, a nice name and calling it is often a lot clearer than putting in the whole complex condition, which we have to puzzle out every time. And it's easier to reuse later because you reuse it in many different places. Um, and this reduced complexity lowers the risk of, of error. Um, so uh, we can use function abstraction within any logic, and we do. So these models that you've seen make lots of use of it, whether it's from any logic or from examples from students I've shared or, or what have you. So for example, this model here, in person, we might have um, various uh, methods that call you know, smoking initiation hazard, uh, is current smoker. Uh, count contacts, uh, you know, age coefficient for smoking initiation for a given age. These are all methods. They hide some potentially complex calculations, um, and we can call them from within this uh, person or from the main class, for example. Okay. Um, so I'd like you to open up agent-based model with birth death, which was sort of the, the prototype for that profile example we saw earlier. And I'd like to see um, ways in which these functional abstractions uh, feed on each other. Um, I should note that uh, this particular model is making use of a naming convention that's departing a little bit from any logic, excuse me, from Java's conventions. Normally in Java, methods are named with a lowercase first letter rather than an uppercase, and so don't take this as representative. But if you open up agent-based model with birth death and you go to the person class, what you'll see is that there's several methods there. One is called confirm birth, and that takes responsibility when a woman um, goes from pregnancy to an pregnancy. this performs the birth. And, and so it basically makes sure the baby's born and has the appropriate connections to get started in life, okay? If we go to perform birth, um, this is a function in any logic, and we'll go look at the code for it, and uh, what we'll see is that the code for it, we've actually seen this go before. It's, it's getting a reference to the mother, it's adding the offspring and getting a reference to that baby, and then, importantly, it's calling, okay, establish the baby's connections based on the mother's connections, and then establish the baby's location based on the mother's location. Now, these are potentially complex operations. What, what uh, connections does the baby have? Um, well, um, that may be, uh, require um, uh, a certain specification, but you can describe it much more quickly than write the code for it. So um, this method here, we used to hide the details of exactly to what, what uh, agents the baby's connected. We delegated from short to another method. We delegate establishing its location, where exactly it's positioned visually relative to the mother, to this method. And that allows us to look at this performed birth and basically to parse it more easily. We could say, okay, so basically we have a baby that's born, and then we um, establish connections for the baby um, uh, based on the mother's connections, and we establish the baby's location based on the mother's location. We have a high level view of what this function does. Now how it does it, it, a lot of that, some of that is here, but a lot of it is delegated to those methods. And, um, and uh, we could go dig into those methods. Um, and uh, those methods in turn will go and, uh, and delegate additionally. Okay, now I, I uh, should have, uh, should have shown the bodies of these methods, but um, these methods, each of them involves some code that does the work. Okay, so this is an example of how one method delegates to another. Now, I want to talk about, for, for clarity of understanding, how this process works of one method calling another, even calling a method in the first place. What's going on there? Because it's important for understanding uh, sort of uh, how Java works programming language. But um, 
I wanted to uh, raise this issue of functional extraction so that uh, you have some appreciation for the importance of doing this. I could have pasted in the code from each of these right here. And just in yeah. terms of big picture, as we're yeah. developing our model, would you recommend that we just kind of call the function and then just say, I'll come back later and put yeah. that in? Precisely. Layer by layer Precisely. By layer That's by exactly time. what you do. And it simplifies writing this code. So, um, you know, when the person was writing this code that was involved, they were doing exactly that. So they, they wrote this call, wrote that call, without going through all the gory details of how this would work. They just left that. They delegated that uh, thinking about it um, to, to you know, that other method, which might have been written by another student, which might have been written by somebody else. Um, and uh, they just wrote this code. And it captured for them sort of what needs to be done. And later, they can go back and fill in these pieces. And it might be them, it might be someone else. This is a very important point, um, because it's really about breaking it up into pieces, this divide and conquer, that you allow multiple people to contribute. Um, and also that you simply keep focused on the problem at hand. Because when you're thinking at this level, you don't want to be thinking about all the gory details about exactly what's the call by which you add a connection, you find the ith agent of a person. You want to be thinking at a high level, okay, what's involved in birth, uh, the birth process in this model where there's three basic things. You add a baby to the population, you connect it up, and you locate it. That's what's done. And that allows us to stay at this level. Next, we may go down and pop down to that later level, or we can put deferred even later. But it allows us to kind of make that, uh, to separate those processes. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. um, the other thing is, by the way, and this is a really important point, we can then test each of these pieces separately. So we could test this code, make sure it works properly. We could test that code, make sure it works properly. Um, very straightforward. We could even test this code temporarily using different implementations of these two methods that are particularly simple like ones that return a baby with no connections, or ones that locate the baby right on top of the mo where the mother's located, just to make sure this code sort of doesn't, doesn't yield any, any big problems. Okay, so if I yeah. was doing that and yeah. uh, at a sufficient level of detail, is there a way that I could just test that little snippet of code without testing yeah. everything else in the model? Yes, yes, there is. Um, uh, there are ways of doing that, and if I have time in the class, I will try to talk about that it has to do with this notion of unit testing, J unit testing. And it's a really important thing. Um, I will tell you this. Um, uh, so, so when new software is rolled out, okay, um, uh, that's the result of, of months, sometimes even longer, of effort, okay? And within that that sort of effort that leads to that thing to be rolled out. Um, literally every day, and often multiple times within the day, you will arrive at a new version of the program that includes new features. Okay? And one of the grand insights from software development over the past 25 years is the need for this incremental process. Okay? Um, avoiding the Big Bang, um, this process of saying, okay, well, I'll bring it together at the end with all the features. Instead, you build it up step by step by step incrementally and you keep on adding things in and make sure it works. Because if anything goes wrong, you know, okay, it must have been that thing I just did, you know, or it's interaction with something else earlier. And so you can roll back or you can, you can analyze what's going on there. If you add everything in at the end, it's all globbed together in a way you don't really understand what's influencing what, what's going wrong, you know. So, Building things up step by step by step is absolutely key to effective software development. Now, I would argue that models benefit strongly from and sometimes need that sort of incremental build as well, that sort of incremental step. Now, at every point in that process, to bring it back to your question, every point in that process, there's typically hundreds sometimes thousands of tests that are run on each new version of the software automatically, okay? So when you make a change to the software, it will actually go and it will double check that all these basic properties are maintained by the system, that all these different little pieces of code 
pieces of code like this sort of level of stuff still are working just fine. So that if something is wrong, you know it as soon as possible, okay? Um, and it will alert you to it. And so there's tons of automated testing going on. That understanding how to do that has not significantly penetrated the modeling world. And it needs to. And I've recently written a paper that, that, that relates to that. But it is, is something you can do in any logic through use of JUnit. JUnit is one of the most popular um, Java testing frameworks in the world. And it's very easy to use. And it can be matched with any logic models um, to good effect. Uh, there's some constraints that come because you're building on any logic, but it's you can do a lot of testing with it. Okay, and dividing things up into methods is key not only to keeping focus at a level of, of abstraction when you're writing this code and avoiding just going all you know in all different directions, thinking about how all the gory details of how these are implemented, keeping your focus. It's key not only for that. It's key to divide up the pieces that can be tested independently that can be reviewed independently, that can be profiled independently, right? Because if this were all in one, if all the code, imagine this is 100 lines of code. It's not but uh, in the current model, but it could be. You know, very sophisticated code, taking into account locality and the area of the baby's network and taking into account the likelihood of mixing by age. It could be 100 lines of code. Hopefully, it's 10 lines of calls to 10 different methods that are each 10 lines. But it could be 100 lines of code. If I just splatted that down here, and I did a profile, and it said perform birth is taking a lot of time, uh, where in it is taking time. On the other hand, if it's broken up into a separate method, then I'll see how much time that method is taking. So for a lot of reasons, for accountability reasons, for reasons of divided concrete creating it, of ease of modifiability, of ease of uh, you know, eliminating complexity when creating the code, keeping at a certain level of focus, dividing it up into these pieces is key. Okay, absolutely key. So functions like these, they look um, they look uh, perhaps unnecessary, and then from a certain perspective they are unnecessary, but they save yourself a lot of, of hassle in the medium and long term. A lot of words. Yeah. You, know, you just you know offhand mentioned ten sets of ten lines of yeah. code would be better than hundred. Do you have yeah. any kind of rule of thumb of how small to go? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Um, so I get that that question uh, quite a bit. In fact. Um, um, so uh, a lot of people would advise, and I would. I would join their advice. A lot of software engineers would advise try to keep methods to something on the order of five lines. Mm -hmm. So like a five or chunk six that you could quickly understand. Precisely. Like. Yeah, yeah. It's something that you want to be able to look at mm -hmm. and kind of have a high level understanding of what it's doing and uh, not be overwhelmed by it. If you're starting to see a hundred lines at once, um, it's easy to it's easy to get lost in that. Now, I'm not saying. There's no good reasons to do it. I've coded up some algorithms where um, uh, it, it's hard to totally decompose it, um, you know, down to four or five. But if it's beyond 20 lines, oh gosh, that's, that's to me starting to be really dangerous. It can't even fit on a screen anymore. If, you know, if, if on a single screen it can't fit, that, that starts to be worrisome. Um, and there's large literatures in software development um, on this, and the, the general consensus seems to be in modern software development, keep it really small and keep it delegating. Keep it delegating to well-named methods. Yeah. Okay, that, that seems kind of common sense to me. What's the, what are you giving up by doing what's, what's the trade-off? Yeah, there is, there is some trade-off. It's surprisingly small, uh, but I'll mention a couple things, okay? There is a case to be made, and and I would, I would, uh, argue that it's um, modest in its impact, that there's some loss of performance. Okay? So when, when this method has to call this other method, some work has to be done that otherwise wouldn't need to be done. Um, it's um, I'm trying to search for a real world sort of a real world flavor of it. Um, um, well, you know, if, if I were to uh, hand off some work to you, I were to say, Bill, you know, could you uh, um, 
could you know I forgot the um, I forgot these things today. Could you go down to my office and get them? I have to hand in my keys, right? Toss it over to you. Um, there's a bit of work involved in that um, for me for me to sort of do it rather than doing it myself. I have to go toss you my keys, right? Um, you might drop them. You know, um, you, you'd have to figure out. Okay, oh, oh that's his house. Key. Oh. <laughs> and, you know, oh, 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 oh that, that, that must be his office key, this one, you know, um, and that takes a bit of time, right? So there's some loss there, and I'd say it's kind of comparable loss. Now, I would go nuts in the world if I couldn't delegate things to students and delegate things to, you know, other people, but th there is a modest amount of loss here. Now, the way things have developed in software, to, software engineering, it used to be that was a much bigger loss. And so it kind of clouded people's understanding of the trade-offs. Mm -hmm. And people thought, oh, delegating methods, it's, it's a nice idea, but it's really expensive. These days, it's not very expensive. Because it's needed so much processor architectures and hardware has been evolved so that, so that it's actually quicker, among other things. But it does have some cost. So that's issue one. I'll tell you what the other issue, though, is. And I think this is more of a... Um, significant issue. Um, there are times where um, you want to get, you want to put aside the kind of high level understanding of the what and you want to say show me all the details of, of, of how things are done as a whole so I can see how it all fits together in terms of the how. Okay, So show me kind of the key salient elements of the model uh, it, and how they're implemented so I can grok it, sort of it, how in, in detailed terms it's doing its work. Um, this is a, an expression of, of interest you often hear from uh, electrical engineers, you hear from physicists and so on. They want to see the, the nitty gritty details, they don't want to sort of uh, be distracted by sort of abstractions. And I think there's a case to be made that sometimes you do want to do that. Um, to sort of break down the abstractions and see the nitty gritty. It's kind of like saying, show me, show me how the car works, right? For the most part, when I go for a long drive, um, I don't want to see all the details of how, how, how the car works. My wife doesn't want to see all the details of the how the car works. We just want to know, okay, if this gauge is low, you put gas in it. You know, uh, if, uh, you know, periodically you pull this thing up to see if the oil's there. I don't want to know all the details about how the oil thing is connected to the engine. Those are, those are details I'd like to delegate, right? But there are times where the engineer in me says, um, yeah, show, me, show me how this works uh, because it's making this weird noise, right? Um, and so there are times you want to see how it works. Now there's, it turns out there are ways of getting some understanding of blowing down the abstraction barriers and getting some understanding of how it works um, that do not require um, abandoning abstraction. So fundamentally abstractions can sometimes get in the way of an appreciation for the low level details, but there's tools, there's technologies that can be used to kind of temporarily remove the, the, the veil of abstraction as it were, so you can look at the details and then put it back in. Because it is critically needed for human capacity to deal with complexity. That's, that's one of the key components of it. And ability to delegate things to different people and to test different pieces, to profile different pieces, to review different no, lots of good, lots of good things. So I, I'm more, I'm, I'm more uh, uh, appreciative of or uh, sympathetic to this whole issue that it, sometimes you want to see the details. And uh, I grant that it's sometimes uh, uh, inconvenient for that given the current state of technologies. But again, there are tools out there that will help you sort of have x-ray vision and see through what's going on. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But short, sweet methods that each, you know, delegate a lot. This is kind of the, um, the view of what's good. So I've heard, you know, uh, famous people um, who have written uh, books on software engineering um, and talk about clean coding advocate three and four line methods is preferred. Um, you know, so, so maybe you have a, a while loop, for example, or a for loop, as we've seen, and the body of the for loop is a call to another method. Mm -hmm. And because it's named, you see what that each, each, each um, iteration of the for loop is doing. It has a nice name to it. You know, like 
uh, so four loop from one to a hundred, and, and and it says you know add add connection to random agent or something like that. And by glancing at that, you can see oh okay. So basically, what this method is doing is a hundred times it's adding a hundred um, a hundred edges to random agents in the population. And then if you want to see the details about how it does that, you dig down to that method. And maybe you know what that does is um, it calls off the method to uh, pick a random agent from the population, and then it um, you know uh, calls off a method to um, you know uh, get the neighbors of that agent, and then it uh, um, you know calls off to a method to you know get an edge not to one of those neighbors or something like that. And so each of those is named, called, and you have a very clear understanding at that level of abstraction, kind of what the steps are, and you write those things. You're not writing all the details. You're just writing at that level, and later you go and teach those details. Okay. Yeah, make sense? Yeah. So this is this is one of the reasons. Uh, so I teach software development. I teach software engineering to software engineers, and these are some of the principles we use. And it's things that uh, students struggle with as well. Um, okay. So let's talk about methods. So let's talk about w what's going on here, because we want to know. I mean, um, uh, here we have a reference. A variable as a reference to a mother, a variable as a reference to an offspring, and we call this method with those two references, and we call this method with those two references. What does that mean that we're passing these to this method? What's what's going on there? What's the semantics of Java? The meaning of that call? Okay, um, the semantics of method calls. Um, well, uh, methods are basically functions you call in an object. Okay, so when I use the word method. It's not just um, any function. It's a function you call on an object. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll give one one sort of exception to that. But it's basically uh, functions you call on an object. In other words, uh, that that function has a hidden parameter called. Anyone want to guess? We've used it before many times. It's the hidden parameter called to a method by which it knows on what object it's been called. This, this. Um, okay, so methods can commonly do one or both of two things: compute values and perform actions. They either change the state of the program by doing something, like printing something out, displaying something, or changing the state, making something visible or invisible, or they compute a value. Um, so that's a compute more than one value from the array set. Um, and there's basically two pieces. The header says what types of method expects and arguments. Describes the code, the, the how. Okay, um, okay. And method bodies consist of variable declarations, and statements, and statements are commands. We we we've, we've seen that. Okay, um, so a key thing here is parameters or arguments. Basically, for a method to do its work, it has to be given some information. It's really what it comes down to. You have to give it information to do its job. So. Um, if I need to get, get Bill to open my office, I need to remind him. Maybe he knows well what it is, but you know what office number it is, and I have to say, okay, if I had a big wad of keys, you know, it's this key. So I give you two pieces of information. You can go do your job, right? Um, so parameters—they're called parameters and arguments—and there's a subtle difference between them. I won't get into because you could. You hear people abuse them in different ways, and so fundamentally, they refer. In common discourse, to very similar things, parameters and arguments um, are provide the sort of information a function needs to do its job. Okay, and they're passed to the method. Okay, um, parameters are only available inside the method. Once the method exits, the parameters go out of ex the the parameters go out of existence. That doesn't mean things referred to by the parameters go out of existence, but the particular parameters go out of existence. Okay. Um, so just because we have a parameter and it's A, it's not changed to any value of A outside the method. I'll come back to this point. Okay. So you can call a method that has a parameter called A, and inside that method, A means that parameter. But once it returns, A may mean something different than it meant before the call. Um, okay. Uh, and as I said, most methods, and we'll get to the exception of static method, this is passed to the parameter. It's passed implicitly. It basically tells the method on what object we've invoked it. So when we call p dot is infected, if p is a reference has a reference to a person, inside is infected, 
this refers to the same thing that what refers to outside of it? P refers to outside of it. Yeah. So, so P is some is is a reference to some object, and inside is infected. Um, when that code is running, there's some code here that maybe checks the state with respect to multiple state charts, or who knows what awful things. Inside that, this is referring to the same guy, right? Um, and and uh, that's that's what's passed implicitly to to um, is infected. Okay. Um, so in Java, if we have a thing called mod method, okay, um, and it takes in a parameter a and it assigns five to a, that doesn't change anything in the outside world, okay. Um, so if we if we add some um, some value b outside, we call my method with the value b. It doesn't modify b in any way. It's actually it's actually passing the value of b. So it computes. Okay. Oh, it says oh, there's a b there. What's the value of b? It says two. Okay. So it's going to pass it the value two. Two becomes the value of a, and then a value changes from two to five now, and and, and then after it's done, it returns here, or after this call to this method. But B has, been, has not been modified. It just passed the value here, the value got, it got assigned to a, a, a variable A, and then it got overwritten. We'll, we'll come back to this in a, in a minute. But suffice it to say that, that you can assign to parameters, and it doesn't change the value. It doesn't, it doesn't um, uh, lead to anything outside the method as as changing. So here's perform birth. We're going to come back to this example. Um, let's consider establish offspring connection based on mother's connection. You recall that perform birth called this, right? Um, okay. So uh, here's perform birth. Um, so prior to the method call, we have mother equals this, offspring equals this thing. Okay. This is in perform birth. We've got the mother. This is just another variable to name this. We're calling perform birth on the mother. And just to be clear about it, we want to say, okay, mother equals this. We don't we could always refer to this instead of mother, but we want to emphasize this is the mother. You know, I am the mother here. So we want to give it a, a nice name. So we have a, a variable that has that also as a reference to whatever this refers to. Then we have the offspring, right? And now we're going to call um, establish offspring connection based on mother's connection, okay? And we're going to do that work, and then we're going to come back here. Okay? We're gonna, after it's done, we're going to be back, and we're going to return and continue on to add the offspring location. So we're down, going down here, and we're going to be calling this method. What's going to happen? Okay, perform birth is going to call establish offspring connections based on mother's connections, and then it's going to return back to right after the method call. In other words, it's going to go, it's going to call off to this, it's going to be inside of this code, and then it's going to come back to, to this point. Does that make sense to people? Okay, so in this code, it's going to be chunking along each, each statement here. It, it creates a new variable called mother, makes it point to whatever this is pointing to. It, it adds the baby to the population, uh, adds a new member of the population and, and gives it the name offspring, right? It has a variable that refers to that uh, baby. Um, okay, then we're about to call this establish offspring connections based on mother's connection. Okay, we pass it two pieces of information. I'll talk about what that passing it means. We give it two pieces, just like I'm handing you my keys and telling you which one, which one it is, and that's what's called a method call. We're making a method call to establish offspring connections based on mother's connection. Right, so. While we're making that method call, we're right, we're, it's running code that's in this. It's running Java statements that are in establish offspring connections based on mother's, connect, uh, mother's connections. After those statements are done, maybe it's one line, maybe it's 10 lines, maybe it's 100 lines, maybe it's 10,000 lines spread through different methods. After that's done, we're going to return back at this point here. Okay. In other words, we're coming down here, we make this call, and then we're going to return and go here. Okay. That's the standard flow of execution. There's an exception for what are called exceptions. We're going to get to them. Okay. But um, that's why they're called exceptions, because they're exception to the rule. So you, you go down here, you call this, this returns, you continue on execution. Okay. 
Okay, so um, we want to know what's going on here. How is this working? And in fact, if we were to go look at establish offspring connections based on mother's connections, what we'll actually see is, and darn it, um, I thought I, I had it right uh, here. Let me, um, let me actually just uh, open it up a second, because it actually, I, I would like to show it to you here. Um, so, um, example models, uh, ABM model with birth, death. Um, uh, ooh, 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 yeah, it's going to eclipse the buggy one. Okay, come on. Um, I'll track, probably eclipse the buggy will be just fine. Um, so, uh, pardon me as I get this up here. Um, I believe this has the same functions here. Yes, there we go. Okay, this is what I, I, I want to show you. Um, establish offspring connections based on mother's connections. That actually takes two arguments, two parameters. One is called offspring, one is called mother. And what we're going to address now is this offspring and mother, don't those sound familiar? Where did we see those before? The names used in born birth, um, mother and offspring. But the answer is they're different. It turns out that they don't care about these, these names here. It's for the sake of this code, we've, we can use those names to mean whatever this code wants those names to mean. When we return, then we'll be back sort of in a situation where these mother and offspring, again, mean these, these things uh, up here. So we're going to take a look at this. In order to understand this, we have to talk about what's called the call set. Okay? One function can call another. Because that function can call another, then return. Because we can do that however many times we want, we need a way to get back to where we were after the, after the return, after, after that call. So we have to get back to the state where the values of all local variables are sort of associated with, um, with, with what's going on in this code and where in the program. So the call stack is what does this, okay? Method variables, like those variables of parameters and names within the code of the method, live on what's called the call stack. Um, when a method calls another, there's something called an activation record passed on the stack. Now this sounds all horribly complex, but a few basic principles will help you understand why this is relevant and will actually clear up uncertainties, I think, okay? And most importantly, operationally, you'll sometimes encounter call stacks and error message, and in fact, in, in debuggers that we're gonna be looking at. And occasionally, you'll see it in any logic, okay? Um, revealed. Um, so let's, let's consider this code for perform work. We have these couple lines of code. Got a, got a variable referring to the model. Not a variable referring to an offspring. We reported that happy event to the world. We're about to call this. We're about to call this method, and we pass it two pieces of information, namely offspring and mother. Okay? Okay. Now, um, when we call that, we are now going to be in the code for established offspring connections based on mother's connections. Okay? This is the code for that. And it turns out it's not as horrible as we might have thought, at least not right now. But you'll notice this call also calls offspring.connect to. It actually makes a call itself to another method. So in short, what we have is something like this. Perform birth call this guy. This guy calls connect to. And then this is going to go back to that. And then this is going to go back to that. Okay. Um, there's this is, has to do with the call stack. Um, okay, so this is associated with the call stack here, okay? Um, unfortunately, the highlights didn't show up too well here. But there's some variables associated with perform birth. This and offspring and mother, okay? Um, so let's go, go look at that just in the code here so, so we can see this. Perform birth is here. Um, and we'll look at the code. Here's the code for perform birth, just to remember it. Um, I'd say there's three variables around in this method, okay? You'll notice this method did not take any variables explicitly as, as so-called arguments or parameters. The, there's therefore three variables around. Mother, that's a variable we created here, right? It's a variable. 
offspring. It's a variable here, right? What's the third variable that's around? What's the third variable which I can refer to in this code? In fact, I do refer to in the code. In the very first line, I refer to another variable called this is actually a class name for person, but there's a variable referred to there. Okay, that's the one I'm creating. So there's mother, there's offspring, there's a third one. This, that's, that's a variable name. It just happens to name this one that's implicit. It's sort of, it's me. It's asking about me. Okay, so there, there's, in other words, it's activation records. There's a reference to this. That's, that's me, okay, okay. It, it's up there, that one there, the right one. Mother actually is assigned to the value for this. So in other words, whatever reference this had was referring to, mother now refers to. So it's referring to that same one, right? Referring to that one in the upper right. If, this, if that's me, if that's this, then it becomes mother because the code, the code just assigned, assigned to it here. Whatever was in this, whatever value this referred to, now mother refers to. There's gotta also refer to, to this. And then offspring might refer to this. This is the baby maybe, right? This could be the baby. So this is the mother. And then, you know, initially that baby doesn't exist. Um, uh, not quite tall enough. Um, uh, and, uh, and then uh, initially that baby doesn't exist. Hey. You know, uh, joyous news. Uh, it comes into the world. And so offspring refers to that baby in that method, in perform birth. And then perform birth says, okay, now I've got to call this establish offspring connections based on mother's connections, right? That's this whole thing where it calls this one here right, right at this point in the code. And it's going to pass it as, ref as, as, as arguments offspring and mother the references to offspring and the, re the reference to offspring and the reference to mother okay so as a result offspring and mother are are now live in established offspring connections based on mother's connections let me let me just go show that here um establish offspring connections based on mother's connections you'll see it you'll see it right here see it says function arguments um so in other words, this is saying establish offspring connections based on mother's connections, saying, I'll do my work for you, but you gotta give me two things, okay? Give me two things, buddy. You gotta give me a reference um, to the offspring. If you want me to establish the offspring's connections, you have to tell me who the offspring is. That's one piece of information I need. And, and uh, secondly, if you want me to establish their connections based on the mother's connections, you gotta tell me who the mother is. I need to know that information to do my job. So those are declared as arguments, as parameters, formal parameters to this method, okay? Called formal parameters. And, um, and so this is saying, okay, for me to do my work job, you've got to give me this. I'm not going to do my job unless you give me that, okay? So, so in fact, that's in fact what you saw happen, uh, that uh, when this guy was called, it went perform birth, called this guy, it gave it two values for those, right? So when, when we make this call, um, there's actually code here for, um, excuse me, this uh, established offspring connection based on mothers. There's two variables because we provided a value for each of those as part of the contract to do its job. There's a value for this and a value for mother. In other words, um, that are provided immediately. And then there's another variable called this that's provided um, as well. Now, uh, I actually didn't bother specifying this. It probably should have. Uh, but this, uh, because this is a method uh, called an object, there's actually a value for this as well. So offspring refers to this one, and mother refers to that one, OK? Um, but you have to realize this offspring doesn't care directly about the fact that there's another one named this, named offspring. I could have labeled this with a capital O and this with a lowercase O, or I could have given them the same names. They don't interfere in any way. All that happened is the value for this got passed as the value for that. So this could have had whatever name. Let me see if I can illustrate this in the code. 
I could have just as easily called this, watch this, to, to illustrate the point, I could have just as easily done this. Um, uh, well, here, let me, let me put it this way. Instead of saying offspring, I could have called it child, right? And in the body, then I'd have to refer to child, right? And, and child. Um, and that will work just as well. Um, from the point of view of preferred birth, whatever it's named, these things is immaterial. It can name it whatever it wants. It can name it offspring, sure, no problem. It can name it child. It's a different, it's a different meaning for, it's a different sort of uh, variable than this offspring. It's, it just happens to have the same name. It needn't have the same name. Okay, so this is the activation record. And then what happens here is this thing calls connect to, okay? Um, Establish offspring connection actually calls connect to here. And it calls it on the child or on the offspring, okay? Um, when we do that, um, what is this going to refer to? It's going to refer to which one of these two? Remember, this is for the mother, this is the offspring. So what is it going to refer to in that connect to? It's going to refer to what? Inside this call, what is this going to be referring to? It's going to be referring to... Yeah, it's going to be referring to the child, to the child. And it also passed, passed it this, which is, is actually referring to, uh, uh, referring to, uh, happens to refer to uh, the mother. So um, that's, that's not, but we should probably call that, it should really say child connect to mother, okay? So it says establish a link between the baby and the mother. So that would be clear if, if we just did that. Okay, so um, there's this thing called the call stack, and every time we make a call, something gets put on the call stack. Um, and uh, when one call calls another, it puts something on there. The things up here don't really interfere with the things down here in any way. The things in these upper levels don't, they don't bother the things down here. And when this is done, this will return here. And when this is done, it will return here. Um, and so on, all the way down. Um, so um, let's, let's reinforce the, the previous points. Um, so again, if we had a method, and this is how in Java we declare these things. You saw, you saw in any logic, folks, that, um, that uh, the way in which we declare formal parameters is, is here. The way in which we declare arguments is here. On Java, if we want to declare our own little Java, this is how you do it. You say double A. My method, these are the parameters here. And, and then this is the body, this is the code. So if I had something which accepts a value, call, and I call it A, a variable A, and then I assign A to 5, and I were to call this thing with a value of 2, that doesn't change in any way this A. This A is a different A than that one. One, one of the A's lives down here, so to speak, and the other A lives up here. They're two different A's. It doesn't, it, those A's don't interfere at all. Just because I named this A doesn't in any way interfere with that one or vice versa. Um, so, so if I had this code, I have A equal to, I call my method, and then I were to print out the value of A here, A would still be two. Um, this A got modified, not, not that A there. Does that make sense? Uh, okay, so so what's unsettling here? What's unsettling? It just seems like is, is the A what is A mean? What does A mean? Is A pointing to a location or does A okay. actually hold something? Okay, okay, so those are very good questions. Those are very good questions. A is actually in this case holding something. It's holding a value. So A is the label for this point. Okay. It's the label for that location. That, this is A. A is this thing. You don't sort of write it like that. Right? Okay. This thing is A. Okay. Now, now um, what I said is that uh, we, we had an A down here that was 2. Excuse me. Um, and then we called off this up that we passed in an argument and this was two and then this became got assigned to five. But again, this is a, a different A. And then then this guy is gonna return. This guy goes away, that guy is still two. Um, so when we when we make this call, this thing labeled A appears is two as well. Because this guy is passed value 2, 
the value. So only pass the value. Pass the value two. Number two. And that goes into a location called A, a new location, which lives up here. And then that location is assigned the value five. Okay? And so this location is assigned five. But that doesn't change what's in that other location. The five, right? Um, and then this code, once it finishes, goes away. Goes away. And we're back to that. That's the call stack. That's that's this guy here. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so but let's let me ask this though. Here, okay, so you ask a critical question, but I want to make a, a key point about this. So we've been talking about values here, and you asked a, a really good question about whether it's the same or different, right? Um, we just rehearsed how this goes. But let's say it's we did something different. Let's suppose that that A down here holds a reference to some person. Okay? Um, Holds a reference to Al. Okay? Um, and let's suppose that we called another method that took that reference to Al and then assigned a different reference to A here. So it assigned a reference to this guy here. Like, like that. Would that change this reference at all? And then we got rid of this. I would argue that no. We can actually assign, whether this holds a reference or not is actually not directly material, but you've got a really good intuition because there is some other way that this guy can be interfered with. So if this guy was simply, so if we had my method um, and it assigned, um, you know, it assigned, uh, so it, it took down a person, call it, uh, I'm going to call it just to avoid, so you confuse, I'll call it P, right? Um, just to work for my, so mixing apples with oranges, mixing people with numbers. Um, if, if we had something like this, and P equal Joe, or something like that, you know, we pointed to Joe, um, and maybe this is Joe here. No, it's Al. Um, so if we had P equals equals 
some reference to Joe, right? And then we call my method two, right? Um, my method two on P. So initially, we're calling this. This is a say person P. Um, It's the same person that it, it was referring to earlier. We didn't magically change who this referred to. What we did do is we changed some attributes to that person. We changed some characters. So, so what is the actual reference? Is it, is it some like hidden ID number or like you know? Well, essentially, it's a hidden ID number. It's an ID number to some raw memory location mm -hmm. in the computer. It's it's just a sort of number whereby you can find this this information. Um, and so you can think of it as like a social security number. As long as you can look it up mm -hmm. in some way. Um, it actually may be slightly more sophisticated than that given garbage collection and so on, but I think that's the, uh, the, essence, that's the essence of how it's done. What's really important to realize, though, here is uh, that um, this, whatever name we give it here, is immaterial as far as that's concerned. And nothing we do up here, um, like if we assign a new reference to this one here. It's not in any way going to change what this one refers to. The fact that we call this P is not going to be, it's not going to matter to this. We could have called it A, we could have called it Q, we could have called it whatever we want. And that's part of the design of, of, of Java, of modern programming language. You don't want the vagaries of how you happen to name this to screw other code up. like let's suppose like this method um, here uh, establish offspring connections based on mother's connections um, and they saw suppose that it used uh, offspring you know instead or they saw that that it used the same word for mother here and they're not sure you know how is that relate to the mother down here um, it 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 really is not worth getting um, getting all worked up about um, about how this mother is related to that one. The key point is that whatever information is passed, whatever value is passed that's the second value when this call is made is given, is associated with a variable called called mother um, here. And, and you can then assign to that or whatever. It's not going to affect the other mother. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Uh, uh, and so there's this call stack, and one after the other, they get built up on this call stack when these and 
This is literally what's going on behind the scenes when you're running Java code. There's a call stack, and sometimes it may be 15 methods deep. You know, A calls B, calls C, calls D, calls E, calls F. And it's all because there's delegation going on. You know, simplifying your life by, by when you're writing the code, you don't want to worry about the details, so you just have a call off to something, and later you go about writing it. Now, there's actually very good reasons to do other things. Uh, other, there's other additional good reasons we'll be talking about maybe today, probably next time, on um, using what's called subclassing and subtyping. Because you might not even know who's, whose implementation it is that you're calling of my method or something like that until it actually, uh, until it actually is called. But suffice it to say, this is call stack built up. The upper levels don't know about the lower levels. Um, they simply do their work and then they return to it. The only thing they can do to interfere with the activity of the lower levels is they can change things in things referred to by the lower levels. That's, that's what they can do. But they can't change magically the variables there. And one doesn't have to know about the variable namings of the other. Okay? So you're free to use whatever names you want here. Now, you will see this call stack sometimes in fact, I'm going to I'm going to make this call stack happen. Um, I'm going to turn lemon into lemonade. Um, uh, and watch this. Um, we're going to make this call stack appear in the most unpleasant of circumstances. So I'm going to um, I'm going to run this. Do you remember what happened when I ran this before? I tried ran <laughs> I don't know what it looked like, and a rude surprise happened to me. Remember this? Okay. Um, so it was an unhappy camper. Let's see what it complained about. Ah. Oh, look at that information. What do you think that information is? Let's go look at that up, up close. What do, you, what do you think this information is? What is it putting out for me there? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you uh, some of the first couple things. Okay, it says it has an assertion error. That means some assumption was violated. Okay, uh, the first thing, it, it says at ABM model with birth death, that's the name of the model, dot person, that's the name of the class, dot fertility rate age sex ethnicity. And then it says at ABM model birth death person dot evaluate rate of. And then it says at com dot xj dot any logic dot engine dot transition rate dot start. Da 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 da. And it, it, it goes on um, down here. This, ladies and gentlemen, is none other than the call stack. Call stack. <laughs> that is the call stack. It is printing out from top to bottom the contents of the call stack. This is saying this thing, call that 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 thing, and something bad happened way down in the bowels there. It's almost as if perform birth, call the Savage Rothman connection based on mother's connection, call connect to, and something bad happened at connect to. It says, I don't know what to do. Something bad, bad, bad has happened. Um, and, and this is telling me where it occurred. It's saying the context. The context being this guy called that guy, called that guy, called that guy, called that guy. Um, and you ended up in this place called fertility rate age, age and sex. Now the interesting thing, ladies and gentlemen, and it's a mark of today's software engineering world, and my students are getting used to it still as well, is that what this exhibits is the Hollywood principle. Don't call you. Don't call us, we'll call you. Um, so here, the, the striking thing here is that, do you, do you recognize these names? For those who, who are close enough to see it? Do you know the name um, uh, statechart.start or engine.start, experiment simulation.a or experiment simulation.run? Are those familiar to you? I'd be surprised if they're familiar. They ain't familiar to me, at least not very much. Um, but the interesting thing is, one of them called something that is a model that we define fertility rate age sex ethnicity. You folks didn't define it. Someone, someone I know did. And, um, and so that's actually something we define. And that, that got called by evaluate rate of. Okay, now, it wasn't my intention to go into this right now, but just think about debugging. You're going to be presented with things like this. It's helpful to know this is a call stack. Something called something called something. And what this is telling me is 
something went bad in some code that fundamentally the model creator, like myself or a student, created, fertility rate, age, sex, ethnicity. So that's good to know. Something went wrong there. Um, and, it, and it was in, an, uh, in a situation where it was called by evaluate rate of. So that suggests to me it's something to do with a rate in the model. And in fact, if we were to go poke, poke in the model here, um, uh, fertility rate, age, sex. Well, fertility rate, I would guess that it has something to do with going from a, like having to do with pregnancy, right? Um, so maybe it's something to do with like uh, becoming, oh, look, there's a call to it. and. It's calling it with these, so it's passing it these values, right? This is, a, this is a call to a method, and it's giving it a value called current age, a value called sex, and a value called ethnicity. Um, so in short, this rate, some, some method associated with this rate, is calling up to my code and something's going wrong in that code. Um, so we could go then and figure out sort of why, why it's unhappy. But the other thing we could do is, if you go look here, console, and you go look at evaluate rate of, it's actually a, a bit of information here about where it is. And this is actually the, uh, the code itself that it produces. And, and you'll actually see the call to it right there, the call we just saw. And this has to do with sort of the state chart, its implementation of the state chart. Again, this is for not for us to modify, but sometimes you want to see sort of what the context in is here. But look, this is yet another example. Seeing the how, like this, this is probably not going to be too helpful for you. Often just seeing something about the context. Okay, so there's an rate calculation, something about calculating a rate, and that called this. That's useful. That's useful. And then you can go try to track, track it down and figure out what's going, what's going on. And this guy here encountered the problem right there. Ah, so we tried to... <laughs> The plot thickens. Um, we tried to um, calculate the fertility rate, whether someone would become pregnant when they're not female. Um, okay, so so I think there's a, a bit of recalculation needed. Um, um, and, and I say, okay, we should only call this for women. Somehow we called it for men. So we got to go back and, as they say, um, go figure. Um, so, so f somehow we have to associate this with, uh, with something that prevents it from being called for, uh, uh, for men. You'll notice it says uh, guard equals there. I would have, um, would have expected it, but one thing we could do is we could say, okay, if they're female, then, um, then, uh, then we'll, we'll compute the fertility rate by age, sex, ethnicity, otherwise zero. And, uh, and then we could try running this. And uh, I believe now that we will have uh, this bug. Um, OK, so watch this. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the bug is fixed. Due to our friend, the call stack. <laughs> OK, my friend. Maybe, maybe not yours yet. But, but I think you'll enjoy the pleasure of its acquaintance. Um, <laughs> At least the enemy of our enemies. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so sort of by the mafia principle, if it's our enemy's enemy, maybe it's our friend. Well, uh, anyway. Um, okay. So uh, there's a call stack. Every time we make a call to a method, the new parameters get placed on the stack. We just put values on the stack. Sometimes those values are numbers. Sometimes those values are references. We put them on the stack, and then those are given new names. or says you new locations which uh, the thing we're calling can, can make use of. Okay, um, uh, Okay. so yeah, suppose we had um, a call to foo, for example. Um, this is foo here with, um, and it's foo of a comma b, let's suppose, so the formal parameter names. So a is one, b is two. And suppose then we had, this is the definition of foo. Okay, so here's a and b, yeah. And so we call it with, with one, one and two, one comma two. And then it calls bar with this thing here. Um, okay, so it's just going to put these values on. So a plus b times 2 is 1 plus 2 times, so that's 3 times 2, which is 6. b minus a is, is 2 minus 1, which is 1. So the call to bar is going to be with 6 and 1, right? Um, 
Okay. Um, okay. Uh, right. Um, okay. So, folks, um, there's. Um, I, I do want to comment on the exception, which I, I used, uh, which I uh, mentioned once or twice here. Um, most methods are associated with objects. And objects always have an implicit parameter called what? Called this. Called this. Yeah. A method is, it's a method on objects, so it's called on an object. So you have p dot is in fact, you have p dot perform birth. You have p dot, you know, uh, uh, is, is, uh, um, you know, is child or what have you. Um, they're called on some object. Because of that, this refers to that object. Not stated explicitly, but it's implicit. Okay. Um, so p dot connections number. This referred to the same thing as p does. How do we have p dot get connected agent dot get name? Within the call to get name, what will this refer to? To what will this refer? So, so sorry. The agent, the Good. Yeah. Exactly. So within this call. This will refer to what? Whatever P refers to, right? And then this call. And that's going to re return back this computation. It may involve searching the Library of Congress. It may involve, you know, looking up information in the Department of Motor Vehicles Registry for New Jersey. It may, it may involve, um, you know, um, all sorts of complex hairy calculations. It's going to return agent zero. Um, a reference to agent zero. That's going to be a reference to whatever agent zero is here. And, and on that reference, we're going to call get name. So this is going to refer to whatever that agent zero is going to refer to. Right. So, so that's going to be the this for get name. Okay. Um, okay. Why, why, why is it zero? Oh, uh, because they're numbered from oh, start at zero. starting at zero. Uh, sorry, uh, okay, say that again. So, sorry. that's, uh huh. It, it just happens to be that the way that this, that get connected agent is written. It's, guessing, right? yeah, yeah, so it's, one, right? so you could start with one. It just, again, methods, the, the best way to think about it, and this is sometimes not covered till second year of a computer science education, but the best way to think about it is a method is, has a contract associated with it, okay? A function has a contract. It says, you give me this, I'll do this for you, okay? And um, uh, what it will do for you uh, is, um, is specified, associated with the method, it's specified typically informally these days, eventually maybe specified formally, but it's specified what it does. Not how it does it, but what it does. There's a big difference. If it had to promise how it did it, there'd be no flexibility for evolving the code of that, of that method. You'd be locked in to, to how it does it. Um, you know, to, to that particular way of doing it from now on. Instead of specifying what it does, okay, my job will be to refer, to return the, a, a certain agent, right? And that's a contract. It, it sort of says, you give me this, I'll give you that. Now, as Chris said, just like contracts for business or whatever, you could write that contract wherever you want. And in this case, the way it happens to write it is, um, if you give it the number zero, it will give you the first agent connected to P. If you give it the, name, the number one here, it will give you the second agent connected to P. But as Chris said, it could have, they could have decided in their St. Petersburg office to instead have this start from one. So if it said one, it will return the first connected agent. If it had two, it will return the second connected agent. Now it turns out that they were more computer scientists than mathematicians. I think mathematicians would have started from one. Computer scientists um, uh, have tend to start from zero. And, and so they chose this convention of starting from zero. But you know, there'd be nothing to stop them from, from creating a method in the next, maybe in 6.8, they have a method called get connected agent base one or something like that, which is just if you give it one, it gives you the 
first person and zero is illegal as a value. Like that could be. It's, it's all up to just how they defined it. And you can decide if you write a method that performs a valuable function, you could set the terms by which it's used. And hopefully you set the terms in a way it's convenient for a lot of people because that will increase the value. Does that make sense? So that zero happens to mean if you go and you look at the documentation, it happens to mean the, the, the first connected person. Okay, so get connected agent is not something we wrote, that's something that's any line. Any line. Ah, yeah. Okay, got it. All right. Now we could have written it, right. in which case we could choose how to number it. We could have it start from minus one. We right. could have it do whatever. Right. Do whatever. Okay. Yeah. Um, Okay, um, okay, uh, right, um, okay, uh, th so there's two things I got to present now, um, which, which muddy the waters a little bit, but I hope they won't throw you off too much. Okay, so I told you again and again and again, most methods are associated with an object and they have this implicit method list, okay? Now there's an exception. Violation of this rule, and it's called the static method. Okay. Now this is confusing. I, I really dislike. I object strongly to that name, but it's a name enshrined in computing now for 25 years. Or something. It's called a static. Method. It's a method that's not called in an object, ladies and gentlemen. A static method is called on a <laughs> class. It's called on a class, and there's no this. There ain't no this there. There ain't no there this. Um, it's, it's, it's a method which, without an object to refer to. It's not called in an object. It's just called. It's like sign. You call sign of x. It doesn't, it's not called in an object. You just say, give me the sign of, of you know, 0.3 radians, and it will give you back a number, right? Give me. Give me the square of 3.1415926272, um, and it will give you the square. You say, give me the square root of 36. It will give you the square root of 36. Um, those, those don't have to be called on a method. There's no need for a method to call them. They're just, they're, they don't require that information. Um, so this is what we're called static methods. And generally, if, if it doesn't need to be called on an object, you should declare it static. And ladies and gentlemen, I have a confession to make. I have a testimonial to make. Because I have abused your trust. Um, uh, and, uh, and my abuse of your trust, um, if I'm not mistaken, I suspect my... Ah, this method, ladies and gentlemen, establish offspring connections based on babies' connections. Ladies and gentlemen, do you see a reference... Standing before that. Oh, 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 that's a Java bug. Oh, that was an any logic bug. Um, uh, moving right along. Um, <laughs> do, do, you, do, you, do you see a reference to this anywhere? Spy you? With a little eye or big, a reference to this? Is there a reference to this in here? Does this code need to refer to this? Establish offspring connections based on mother's connections. Remember, it takes two things as arguments, uh, a child and a mother, reference to a child, reference to a mother. Those are two variables. And then it, it says, OK, if the mother has some connections, we go through each of the connections, we connect them to the baby. Um, and, uh, and then we, we um, connect the, the mother to the baby. Um, do you see any reference to this here? Okay, there is a this here, but do we need it? No, we don't need it. So, ladies and gentlemen, we don't require this to be, to, to be in fact, a, a method and an object. There's no need for this. And so we could actually declare this, what? That's what I mean by abusing your trust. I was, I was sort of uh, uh, leaving, leaving open you to the idea that those are, are regular methods. Those are in fact static methods, okay? They could be static methods. We don't need, in fact, the, the, the sort of one of the, 
the indications are, ladies and gentlemen, look at the code for perform birth. Are we calling them this dot, are we calling it, like, are we giving an object dot established offspring connection? No, we're just calling it. So implicitly what's going on here is that there's a this dot, but we don't need that. We have, it has all the information it needs with these two pieces of information, true or not. Just like sine is all the information it needs with the, with the value it has, just like square root or square or what have you. So this is all the information it needs. We don't need it to, to be called in an object, so we can make it a static method, okay? It's associated with person still, but we don't need to, we don't need to call it with any sort of, um, with any sort of uh, reference to this. You got all the information you need, and 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 it's giving me a, a little bit of a, a wee complaint here. Um, let's go let's go see what it's saying here. Oh, you know, you know what it's saying. Um, oh oh darn it. Oh man, my life is um, uh, it's it's thrown into. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, okay, so so there's a, a wee inconvenience here. So I made this both static. And it turns out that I, I spoke too quickly. Um, so actually, ladies and gentlemen, there's a thing that says get main. And guess what? To get main, I need, what is this implicitly? It's this.getMain. So I actually need, in order to get a reference to the main class, the current main object, I need a this. And so this guy can't be static, in fact, after all because this guy needs this. The other one doesn't, apparently. Um, and it just needs it to get this dumb, this dumb parameter. Well, I'd be tempted to move this parameter value into the person class, and then I don't need to get the main, and then this could be a static method. But, but uh, those are two complications, and that's why any logic was confusing, was complaining. Does that make sense? Okay. In short, ladies and gentlemen, there's things called static methods. And there are things like sine, cosine, uh, you know, square root, et cetera, things that don't need a, uh, a method. And so like, if you have a table function, something, we saw this last time, right? Maps from, in that case, a certain time or date, on the one hand, to a value. Remember we saw that for the historic data during calibration? Um, that's how we encoded the historic data, very convenient. Does that need a, does that need an object? Do we have to call this on an object, the table function? Like. Do we have to ask an object? Does it need an o Does it need to know this to, to get some more information, or is all that's needed to pass it a value it returns a value? That's all that's needed. It doesn't need to know anything about an object. All I need is, is right there in front of us. It, it, needs, it knows the inflation uh, scheme and so on. It doesn't need to know about this. And so we don't actually need to, to specify uh, of this at all. We we. This is this is static. Okay. Um, it's it's static. It doesn't need to depend on it. So, um, so if you're if that isn't too unsettling, that was one very unsettling thing. Okay. There's one other thing I want to talk with you about. Um, okay. Um, so we've talked about how we build up hierarchies of abstraction. So, you know, perform birth calls us apps offspring connections based on mothers. Um, we might have a fraction of contacts that smoke method that might call count smoking contacts and count contacts and divide the two of them. So, so we count our total contacts, we count the number of smoking contacts, we divide one by the other to get the fraction of our contacts that smoke, right? Straightforward. Um, you know, if uh, you might have count men and you might have a method called count women <coughs> and both of them could, could call up to a method say, Count the number of uh, people of sex, whatever. Um, so in short, we build these kind of hierarchies of abstraction or sort of uh, uh, structures that, that help us um, build up and reduce the complexity of, of our code by delegating. Okay. Um, and um, I'm going to leave leave this uh, comment uh, here, uh, but there's one. There's one awkward fact, ladies and gentlemen, and it has to do with what if something goes wrong? 
What if A calls B, calls C, calls D, calls E, calls F, calls G, and way down in G, there's a disk problem. The network's unplugged. You know, uh, the, uh, the file, you've run out of space on your hard drive. Um, you've run out of memory. What if something goes wrong way down there? Who are you going to call? Um, <laughs> so, so what's going to happen? And the problem is um, that uh, sometimes you can handle it way down there in G. Sometimes you want to do something way at the top level, like present the user a message which says like something bad has happened, please retry, or something like that. You, in other words, you might want to handle it at different levels. And generally speaking, we need to consider this when you define a contract. A contract, ladies and gentlemen, is associated with a method. And a method has a name that should imply what it does, what it does, not how, but what, what it accomplishes for you. It, it specifies what values it needs to do its job, including any constraints in the values, like, like get you know, get connected, um, get connected agent, uh, it takes an integer perhaps that specifies the agent number to give. And it should have a, a, a specification that that number has to be greater than or equal to zero. All right, you shouldn't be passing it negative numbers and say, get me the minus two connected agent. You might say, I don't know what to do. Um, so it might have constraints like that. So that's part of the contract. And then, if you give that information normally, you think of it as saying, okay, you give me that information and I will give you whatever you want. It's like a business contract. You deliver these things and we will pay you $25,000, right? Um, and actually that analogy is a deep analogy that carries over to some other things that we talked about, the subclassing and subtype. It's, it's very much like these human constructs we make with contracts. The problem is that we need an extra specification to make this contract precise. And, and specifically, if things go wrong, we need to say what we're going to do, okay? What things we will handle if it goes wrong, okay? And either you need to handle them yourself, or you need to say, I don't handle them, and you may be shouldering the responsibility. So it's kind of like putting in conditions in a contract, an actual business contract, for things like um, earthquakes or, or natural disasters, or they say acts of God or whatever, these are these are things. You know, if this happens, you want to stipulate. Okay, we will handle it as part of this contract. We'll stick by the contract, or we will um, we will sort of uh, make you shoulder as the as the other party shoulder it. So here we either a method, a, a function method has to either handle it itself, uh, one of these exceptions, or it needs to say that, that this sort of exception should be thrown and it will delegate it to whoever called it, okay? So in short, if perform birth calls whatever, calls whatever, perform birth um, needs to, to call that thing either with the, the, the sense that, okay, if something goes wrong, that thing will handle it or perform birth has to handle it itself, okay? So not uncommon things can go wrong in code. Not all code is like this. In fact, perform birth, we don't have to worry about it for reasons we'll hopefully talk about. Um, but we do want a way to signal something has gone wrong. And when something goes wrong, we want to stop the normal processing of the code. We want to go up to a context where we know how to deal with this. And Java uses what's called exceptions to do this. Okay? Um, exceptions in Java are thrown where they occur, and they're caught in handlers or we have to handle them. We've actually seen exceptions. Do, do any, any of you remember seeing this before? Try, catch? Where did we see it? Does anyone remember the code where we saw it? It was many lectures back. I told you, just, just put this in for now. Where did we see this? It was code to do what? I actually saw it in two places. Yeah, what we were actually doing, and I think it is, um, I think it is, uh, I'll see if I could very quickly get to it here. Um, lecture slides, 
and PDFs and uh, it was in outputting from a model, I think. What would, what would output have to do with a problem? What sort of problems might occur with an output? Outputting and inputting data. Was it, was it this one here? Because it was, what sort of thing might get us in trouble? Um, uh, okay, output to data sets. Yes, yes, yes. Um, um, okay, I think we are, okay. You remember this? What sort of thing could go wrong when we try to output something to a file? List me the ways things could go wrong. Well, there we go. It stands before us in all of its, well, you could call it glory um, or glory. Um, okay, so we try this, and if an exception occurs, we say we give some message. Ladies and gentlemen, Suppose we said, oh, we don't care about this crop. This is nonsense. Let's, let's suppose Java didn't require this. We don't have to do this. We just do it. If something goes wrong, tough luck. Which would you prefer? That it actually does this or that it not handle it? Generally speaking, I would prefer to know if it couldn't work. Because maybe it was a really valuable run and I know I have to rerun it. It's garbage that it put out. Maybe it only wrote half the file and I would just rerun it now. If I discover it only tomorrow, just before class, then I'm in, in trouble. Um, so this is the way that this code is going to try to run. If anything goes wrong here that throws an exception, then well, then it'll basically bomb out of here. Maybe it went wrong here, and it was trying to create this new file name. Maybe it found I can't create it because I don't have permissions. Maybe it it occurred when I tried to write to it, uh, this is actually outputting the data to it, maybe it ran out of disk space. If anything goes wrong here, it'll jump out of here and go into here. And it will then say, okay, I didn't know what, you said the bad happened. Something bad happened, you know, I wanted to let you know, you deal with it, okay? Um, this is not all it could do. It could do all sorts of things. It could try to clean up extra files of my, disk, it could, it could characterize for me the problem. And in fact, the exception message here, E, ladies and gentlemen, E contains all sorts of great information about what went wrong in detail. It'll say like permissions problem, it'll say like disk full problem, or it'll say disk error, you know, corrupted disk or whatever. That information is in E. This is a particularly lazy implementation. But the point is, we could actually, we want to recognize cases where something went wrong. We don't want to just kind of blunder through and have all sorts of extra corruption results as a result of that. We want to handle this. So here's an example, this try catch of this error. And frankly speaking, software engineers don't tend to like to deal with this. They like to think about the case that it works, which is 95% of the case or more what happens. But you want to put in code that can catch things. And sometimes Java will insist you've got to do this. So this is how you do it. You do a try, and you can have a try block, and then you have catch, and you can have several exception types. Exception type 1, exception type 2, exception type 3. The one I just showed you has the very most general exception type here. So it just handles all exceptions. But in general, we could specify very particular types. Like this might handle disk um, corruption problems or disk errors. This might handle uh, out-of-memory errors. This might handle errors where um, you know, the yeah, disk was full. It might handle errors where um, no permissions. So we can handle different types of errors in different ways. And we'll talk probably next time about how we do that through subtyping, um, subclass. Um, so here's another example. Uh, this is from the code that we wrote uh, on reading connections files. Uh, so here, it tried to open this file and then read it in. And if anything went wrong, it said, okay, I was unable to read the specified network file due to this error. And it, it did plus E. What is this plus doing? It is, yeah, it's it concatenating the string representation of E. So E is some, a whole bunch of information run up to it. And basically, this is saying, okay, turn this into a string so it can be concatenated. That's what that thing means. It can be appended to this long string. So E says, okay, 
okay, well, I guess my string representation is blah, and it, it gives all this information, and then it will print out that information here um, associated with that. And then it does what's called a print stack trace. What, ladies and gentlemen, this code stood before you before, and you may have wondered, what is that stack? <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, what is that stack? It is none other than what is what? The call stack. It's this. All it does is it prints the call stack out, just like Java did in red type, a four year faces, not half an hour ago. Okay? Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, this rude fact that something could go wrong, this handles it. And because of that, we view that code as mature code. Um, this code is cleaning up after itself. Okay? This code, this method, process, cleans up after itself. Any, any exception that occurs here, we handle. And actually, there's not too many that occurred there. There's actually, we could actually find out what Every call that we make, we could say, that method, what exceptions can it throw? And we could find out each of them, and then we could handle each of them separately if we wanted to. This is kind of a catch-all thing. Anything goes wrong, you know, do this thing. In any case, this code is, ro is robust in the sense that it cleans up after itself. It, you know, it wipes its butt. Um, it, it, you know, does it, 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 it cleans up if things go wrong. And therefore, it doesn't need, and this is where the things hopefully will start coming together with some of my earlier comments about contracts. It doesn't need any statement that it throws anything. It doesn't throw anything. It's guaranteed that, that uh, it cleans up after itself, and actually, these things don't throw exceptions. So it can't throw an exception, a process one. On the other hand, ladies and gentlemen, this method here, which is to parse a, uh, this is to parse and process a PIAC file, um, uh, edges declarations, um, this can throw an I.O. exception. So this method doesn't clean up after itself. This method just tries to do what it can. And because it doesn't clean up after itself, to be a good citizen, it has to declare what exceptions it can throw. And it doesn't handle those exceptions themselves, so it says, Okay, if you're going to call me, you have to be able to handle these exceptions or throw them yourself. So basically, either a method has to be able to clean up after itself, handle exceptions, or it has to declare that I can throw them. Does that make sense? So that's a basic measure of taking responsibility. Either you say in your contract, hey, look, I'm going to shield you from exceptions, like that top one does, process. Part of my contract, you give me an associated main class and a string that's a file path name, the one I'm, I'm talking about, that header up there. Um, if you give me that information, I'll process this, and you don't have to worry about exceptions. That's what it's telling you. There's no exceptions. <coughs> I'm, I'm simplifying one thing. Um, but uh, there's, for the most part, there's no exceptions you have to worry about there. Um, uh, or you have to explicitly declare the exception. Um, and that's the, what the second option is. In the top option, there's no way you would get to the throw and error. Is that what it's saying? Um, okay, so if I'm to be totally truthful, there's, there's certain types. For the vast majority of exceptions you're going to have to worry about, yes, that's what it means. There's a couple where you don't have to declare because they're just so universal that you can't avoid them, you know, um, even in code where you claim to have cleaned up. But for the most part, yes, that's what it means, that you don't have to worry. For all intents and purposes, you don't have to worry that code will throw it out. Okay? And this code, you do have to worry about it, well, that it will throw exceptions, but it states exactly what exceptions it throws. It will throw I ex ex exceptions. So you have to be prepared. If you're going to call that code as part of the contract, you know, it's promising you give me uh, associated main and a buffered reader, I'll do my job, but I might throw this exception, and that's part of the contract, okay, I understand that, I still wish to call you. You know, um, and that's what that, in fact, this, this first method up here does exactly that, it calls that method, okay? Um, 
Okay, so where do we handle these exceptions? Where do we put these try blocks? Given that we have a chance, choice. Remember, if we have, if we call a method that throws an exception, we have to do two things, right? What are those two things we could do? What are the two options? Either we can handle it here, or we can delegate. We can just throw it, essentially delegate it to someone up there, someone further down on the call stack, right? Either this guy needs to clean up after itself, handle its exceptions, or this guy can clean up after it. In which case, this one has to tell this guy, "You've got to be prepared that I can throw, say, IO exception, right?" Um, so. This has to do with this call stack. This guy's calling, that guy calling, that guy calling, that guy. And sometimes an exception can ripple down like a bolt of lightning from above and unroll the call stack and, and force the guys in the lower level to handle them, the outermost things, by throwing messages to the user. OK, so where do we handle it? Well, often the context of exception is most clear close to its source. So the further one goes up this call chain or up this stack, the, the further low level you get, you're most clear about what you're in the middle of. So on. Um, and um, and uh, excuse me. And then the further down one goes down the phone. So I should have been. Um, uh, the further one goes down the call stack, the less detail you have about exactly what went wrong or, or exactly where it was. Um, but further up, you can more easily abort the overall computation. So if I go way back to where the user first requested it, I might be able to throw out lots and lots of stuff. OK, um, so um, yeah, um, those are my comments on exceptions. I mean, these are the reason I felt I really need to treat this is, first of all, if you're writing code, you're going to run into this, that sometimes any logic will not build unless you handle these things. You write that code that I showed you for outputting, outputting these things. If if you just left out this try and you only did, you left out these things. You only tried to do these things. Any logic would build it. Would say you haven't handled this exception. So you got to know. Okay, wrap it in a try block. And the least you can do is this sort of thing. You catch any exception. You say okay, I couldn't do it. And that's a good thing. A good thing to know about. Keeps you honest. Keeps you, keeps you, um, uh, keeps you reminding you that okay, if something goes wrong, I want to know about it. And it's not a lot of work. It's really not a lot of work. It's a bit of an annoyance, but it's not a lot of work. And really, it's any logic preventing you from being a bit lazy, and and quickly doing it, and then regretting it later when you get corrupted data out and you didn't even know it. You know, until a hundred days later. Um, uh, so, you know, it's it's a good thing. Um, exceptions that you will need to uh, sometimes uh, declare as part of a method. You'll want to say, okay, this method throws these exceptions. Okay, let's let's talk now about where this comes together. So, folks, we've seen any logic methods perform birth, all those sort of things. We've seen those methods. We can also declare methods. And other places, um, you know, in addition to these sort of methods, I could go to person, for example, and I could go to um, advanced here and put in additional class code. I could have, watch this, watch this. I could have, um, uh, you know, void, that means it doesn't, ooh, um, void, that means it doesn't return any uh, information. I could call my method and it takes person, oops, person p and, you know, um, and all it does is it says uh, print ln um, or trace ln, uh, I just print out p. Um, uh, I can declare a method like that. I mean, it's, it's, it's a method there. Um, uh, no, no problem. Um, advantage of having a method in any logic, like one of those graphically shown methods like these, versus a method declared otherwise. Well, two issues, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, um, the primary functions and all supporting functions are visible to others. So they stand in front of you. You see perform birth. You see establish a baby's connections based on offspring connections, etc. They're visible to everyone. I don't know if you always want that. But second of all, ladies and gentlemen, at least in any logic 6.7.1, cannot declare that these are exceptions. You have to clean up. Okay. So that's significant. You, 
you don't have the choice to just sort of say, I'm going to delegate it to whoever calls me. Um, I'm going to just declare I throw ex IO exceptions. You can't do that. Any logic doesn't give you a, a name, a voice for doing that, at least in the current version we're using. Maybe 6.8 does. Um, so exceptions are the awkward sort of exception to the fact that you're dealing with you know, parameters, in other words, arguments passed to a function and the return value as part of the promises and, and you know, uh, promises and what's done and to give them with the name. You also need to worry about exceptions sometimes. And sometimes you will find any logic complaining that this exception is not thrown. Let's let's let me just um, let me just go see what it will complain. Okay, I'm just going to take this this code here, and I am going to copy it now. And let's see what it complains. This will be the final thing we do. So there's some code. It's in any logic. It's going to complain. Um, so um, it has it has two two error messages. One of them I already know about. Um, and uh, let's go see the other. Um, so, so here we go. So what is it saying? Um, okay, oh, file outputs here. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I need to do one other thing. Um, so I need to go for this whole thing um, and put in, um, uh, excuse me, I'm having, um, having uh, yeah, import. Uh, okay, that's just for that dependencies. I just need to do it here. Okay, so I need to do it here in imports, import java.io.star, okay? And then let's, let's try it now, okay? And it will still, it should still encounter errors, yeah. And here we go, let's go see. Okay, um, oh gosh, it says it, this is a syntax error. Um, okay, what's, what's going on here? Um, what's your problem? Um, okay, uh, so it says syntax error token this okay what's what's the problem um okay uh let me let me just try this foo um okay uh is still gonna give a problem okay yeah um okay now it's it's still encountering a difficulty i don't know what's uh what's its problem Leave that see what's going on here um uh, okay um so so, okay, here we go. Uh, unhandled exception, that's what it is. Um, I don't know what this, uh, P uh, so trace, trace ln foo, I don't, I don't know why it, it didn't have a problem, but this is the main thing I wanted to, uh, see it says unhandled exception type file not found exception. So that's when it would sort of warn us, okay, we gotta put a try block around it. Um, and okay, now it compiles fine. It was maybe something to do with my pasting in of things. Um, but um, it's it's basically saying okay this um, you need to you need to catch these um, uh, these problems okay I am looking for the problems window and oh it must be it must be over here um, uh, no 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 that's that huh um, should be a problems window around um, uh, properties. Um, Oh, maybe this is it here. Uh, problem. There we go. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, there's still um, it's still something happened when I when I pasted in. I think. Um, okay. Any case, um, uh, that's that's the exception that occurs. It says you know uh, did not handle that exception. So, um, uh, in that case, you have to put a try block around it. Okay. So that's all for today. Um, Again, I'll try to get back to you on the exact due date uh, for that, but it won't be before the 22nd for the, uh, for the uh, projects. And um, uh, I, I will try to get the, uh, the profiling thing working with the latest version of any logic and post some slides associated with that. Okay, good. Thanks very much.